So I'll start with uh, Venki. R. Venki Finch is the Chief Scientist at TCS Research and heads its verification and validation program. He has been with TCS for more than 25 years, working primarily in the areas of software development, formal methods, and verification. During his tenure, he has led several tool development projects, including TCS ECA, a static analysis tool that is sold commercially by the company. Other tools include Mastercraft and more recently a formal specification um, notation called EDI. EDT. 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 So let's welcome Eshi. Uh, Deepak D'Souza is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Automation of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His areas of interest include program verification, program analysis, and specification and analysis of real-time and hybrid systems. Deepak received his PhD from Chennai Mathematical Institute in 2000. Welcome, Deepak. <laughs> Ashutosh Gupta is a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. Ashutosh is interested in formal verification, building model checkers for verification of sequential and concurrent software, modeling of biological systems, and constraint solving. Ashutosh finished his PhD at TU Munich, and was previously a faculty member at EIFR Mumbai. Welcome, Ashish. Uh, I am the moderator. Uh, that means I have the easy job of asking questions, and they have the harder job of answering questions. But uh, I can also answer some questions, I guess. I am a faculty member at IIT Delhi in the Computer Science Department. This is uh, where we are, we are currently holding the meeting. I work in the areas of compilers and formal methods. Uh, all right, so, so that's a uh, way of approaching. All right, so let's uh, you know let me just um, give a you know so the, the theme of this uh, panel discussion is what is the biggest use case of formal methods, right? And uh, I'll actually go I mean I'll let each of you share your thoughts maybe like four or five five minutes. Like, what are your thoughts? On what are the biggest use cases on formal methods? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can start with Ashutosh. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, you hear time to time some, some big usage, for example, the verification of airbus software, and you know, you have to speak a little louder because okay. yeah. you, use, you hear time to time a big uh, uh, applications. For example, the airbus uh, software is being verified by by the in, in France, and then Facebook has a big team to infer, and they came to use, uh, uh, to verify their websites and. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. So they, they came to verify their, some of their websites and web applications using their input. And Amazon and all the big companies right now built in a lot of these tools. And a lot of these things are opaque and we don't know how much we can use. And uh, so it's, it's still, it's work in progress to really have a one thing you can show. Yeah, this is where we made the difference. I, I don't know which one you can say that, but some of, some signs are there to be. Okay, so Avionics and uh, website development. I thought you were going to say pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love to get the, some thoughts on that. Yeah. So, uh, in, in the, see, the, 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 the medical industry, the patient, I have been interacting with medical uh, they, they, they rely on the very careful development, very slow, and it takes very many years to really come to a design and <coughs> stay with that design for a very long time. But they stay behind the curve for many, many years. And even though the technology moves on. So uh, that's how they ensure safety. But it is not, they are not formally verified as far as I understand. So uh, you can say that all methods have made a difference. No. However, they follow the lot of principles we say should be followed. Very careful design, human readability, and reason to over it, going over it again. I guess, you know, like, I think the theme is not just like what has been, is being used, but what do you see as the next big opportunity? Uh, yeah, I mean, medical devices, of course, and yeah, the pacemakers are, is one, one big uh, thing because uh, it is critical, it is getting more and more sophisticated, and as things go more and more sophisticated, we want to be getting that part. And, uh, and they can pass the Technology matures. All right, thanks. Thanks, yeah, I, yeah, so he mentioned static analysis, which I agree with. All big companies have uh, static analysis tools that they use very regularly. It's suspicious about them, but they do use it very regularly. 
DC, thanks to security vulnerabilities, I think all companies use static analysis for their uh, ECS as a routine static analysis that they use to check all sorts of application code of ECS. That's a one big successful application of uh, common methods. Of course, if you include compilers under common methods, then I think it's be said about it, which is uh, brings me to the next point. I think compiler is one big success which we just can't do without. So I think the next such big application would be uh, program synthesis, which is what uh, where we go to a much higher level uh, specification where somebody doesn't have to be a computer scientist or a software engineer to be able to develop programs. We need to be a domain expert and a good in logic uh, to be able to separate uh, good quality programs. I think that's a really big next application of uh, common method. There's a lot of research already happening in my field and a lot still needs to be done. So from a research perspective, I think that's, in my opinion, that's the next really big application. Verification is such <coughs> testing is used widely, static analysis is used widely. Okay, thanks, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I think it's basically verification. I mean, I don't know about whether things like synthesis would be. Uh, I mean, have a lot of scope in terms of that. You know, having a big uh, impact. Uh, I don't know how to disappoint Stanley, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it can have an impact, but I mean, I don't think it's the same as the verification applications that we have in, for example, safety critical applications. Like the space maker or you know uh, avionics or uh, you know now autonomous vehicles, uh, which uh, I mean I think there's that's the real place where formal methods can have effect, and uh, which I mean nothing else can do. Like testing can give you some amount of assurance, right? but if you really want you know a high level of assurance, you have to resort to formal verification. Uh, that said, I mean, I also agree with uh, Benki that, uh, I mean, rather than these, you know, these big ticket applications, if, uh, you know, we can uh, use formal methods like static analysis kind of applications to, you know, just improve the quality of software all around. I mean, I think that's, that's again going to have a lot of, maybe it's not so visible, right, but the amount of, uh, you know, uh, effort or, you know, pain points that people go through. Can save a lot, lot, lot of it. Uh, I don't think there's So, uh, what I'm saying is, is that cryptocurrency uh, is picking up, and uh, smart contracts. Uh, see, there are companies who are of receiving huge amount of money to verify uh, smart contracts, and. And the thing is that it's not clear that they're doing automatically or just manually reading saying it's good, okay? Uh, but they get paid a lot. And this is a place where the, uh, the question is, we should be asking is that how can I start a company in this area? And where, where would be my business model, right? So a uh, big company like this, you can have a team and support their lot stuff. But I don't know how you turn into an independent business model. So I think this is one big uh, uh, area where new companies can come. Did you want to uh, respond to that? Like, uh, uh, to which part? I don't know. But <laughs> that smart contract. Ah, yeah, smart contract. Yes. Uh, so one big application, potential application in smart contract is being able to, if you are one of the parties to a smart contract, you want to check that all your constraints are being met. Like if you are buying a house, you need to know that whatever you intend as Builder doesn't cheat you, and they do routinely. If you don't read that, none of us read it, but they routinely. So you want to check that, uh, for example, if the area of the house has been specified to be something, you should be able to say, please ensure that this contract says that the area of my house is. So you shouldn't have to go through reams of paper to figure that out. Uh, that's a very useful application, and I think many people will want. But the challenge is trying to get good property. No users are going to come ahead and tell you. That's where one of the hurdles for formal methods has been that getting those properties. That's the reason 
we have settled to uh, routine property, shallow properties as some people call it, like pointer dealer and non-pointer dealer in zero division. If there are good properties, then formal methods can be much used in a, a more factful way. And uh, that's going to be a challenge when it comes to small time. So actually, yeah. So actually, that's been uh, really well into one of the questions I want to ask, which is, what is the biggest bottleneck to get formal methods adopted? I think Nikki already made a point that you know identifying the properties or specifying the properties is one bottleneck. So I mean, with not just I would like all of your perspectives on not just what are these hurdles, but what are the ways to overcome these hurdles, or what do you think is the way ahead? in which these hurdles may be overcome? Or what do you think is the most promising way among all the ways that you see of overcoming these hurdles? That I also want to make a distinction between static analysis and formal methods because I think one, I mean, now, I, okay, maybe maybe it's fine to uh, you know, talk about both in the same way, but I see one of them as trying to do like really deep stuff with very usable kind of things versus static analysis being you know, doing shallow things, uh, maybe uh, for certain different types of actions. So, yeah, maybe people can start with you. Sorry, uh, maybe the second part of the question uh, was not... Well, uh, actually my question is really that, what do you think are the biggest hurdles hmm. to the adoption of formal method? So, we have already identified some use cases, and let me just summarize them for everybody once again. So, we said avionics, website slash security, medical devices, compiler, autonomous vehicles, smart contracts. And this looks like a terrific list to me. And maybe like you may want to put static analysis in the uh, mix as well if you want to you know, include that as part of formal resolution. But or formal methods. But I guess you know like which of okay, so let's say you know pick any one and say what is the biggest hurdle? You know, what what does it take? Or what is the biggest challenge? What was the problem to be solved that kind of you know changes the world from whatever they're doing now to do something different tomorrow? Right. So in terms of adoption, I think uh, there are a couple of issues. One is that the, the customers, the end users need to have the, I mean, they need to understand that this has some benefits, uh, which I'm not sure is currently the case. Okay. And we need to sell that better and maybe, you know, uh, spread awareness more. The other thing is also the, I mean, the, the, the difficulty of adopting these things in, in terms of the availability of, uh, you know, our tools or our techniques, right? How easy is it for someone in industry to, let's say, you know, like Keto, uh, in someone in TCS to adopt these techniques? I mean, the tools are not very usable, and uh, so I think that will definitely... It's a developer education, maybe. Developer education? No, I mean, uh, for us to make better tools, you know, more usable tools, more okay. sensible. Usability. Usability, yeah. But usability, like, okay, maybe, maybe we can go on. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I do agree with you, but selling it is a, you need guys who are willing to sell. Mm -hmm. so for example, David Harrell sold state charts, and it's reasonably widely used in automotive companies and to model state transition systems, are the way they model a lot of their uh, reactive systems. So if someone can say, or MATLAB has done a lot for modeling and as a result, code generation from that. You know, many auto companies will, all of them, I think, use MATLAB. So it's about having that someone who's willing to sell. Uh, that's how static analysis has been sold. And remember, even when Portran was invented, it was not easily accepted. People said, Compiler just can't generate the quality of code that I can write uh, in assembly. Today, the numbers will think of writing in assembly. And, uh, so, it's selling is hard. And that's uh, one thing that we need to be done. And to make selling easy, of course, we need to ensure that tools are scale highly scalable, uh, usable. They have to be usable too. But I think that scalable is the any. Be routinely usable by so static analysis tool should not have too many false positives. Uh, those kind of things are to be there for something to be done. Uh, I think I 
at least I believe there's a very strong, you know, thing, uh, you gain a lot by using good power. It's in terms of cost, sheer cost. We have done actual uh, experiments in testing at least. Uh, things and we found that any use of tools is definitely much cheaper than actually the way it is traditionally practiced. Uh, so, I think a lot of education, you know, like how many, in how many colleges in, in IITs are tools used when people write assignments. These are really small programs, there are tools which can very easily prove them correct. It's routine, you use a bounded model checker on assignment program for a very small bound, it will find a lot of us. But it's never used. And these are the guys who grow up to write programs and so they will never use tools. They have not been told to use tools and uh, they have been kept away. They will all use companies because they have to use it in uh, their institutes. And I think that's a, a big change that is needed. Where as a student, if they believe it's important, students are the ones who influence the future. It's not anyone else. Okay, so so, uh, so there's a joke somebody told me that uh, to build a uh, Paul methods tool, you need a PSP, and to use a tool, also you also need a PSP. So, uh, so, so until uh, until we make it uh, easy enough so that a master's degree level engineer can use a tool uh, our tool, that would be uh, that only can expect it to be adopted. And, uh, sorry. So, there, there, so there, there is a. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, the, the expectation of a in, 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 in industry is it's very steep. For example, we were uh, working with a company in which they wanted to build a product configuration. Okay, so you just get the requirement, to that from the design and say, okay, with this particular version of the product, you need to buy this, this, this product tomorrow, this, this, this component tomorrow, which you arrive at this time, things like that. And they should, they wanted to work it like they were opening a web page. They put a constraint, click on it, and a few milliseconds later, and things will be there. And, and then, that too, they also call a max ad problem, not just that. So, it's just, I mean, they're expecting too much. But until you reach that point, I don't know how you convince a, a engineer like them to wait for two minutes. Okay, they don't want to. So uh, the usability, uh, uh, not only you need to tell them, you need to convince them to please wait for two minutes. Answer will come. And that part, I, I don't think people have appreciated that. Uh, a lot of people don't appreciate logic. For example, they will confuse between A plus B and B plus A. They will say property and you know it's A by B, the guy keeps thinking it's B by Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so that, so since the logic equation is just, the difficulty of the logic is not appreciated. Therefore, the expectation from the tool is unrealistic. Okay. So how do you bridge that gap and how you sell it? I don't know. but. that you write a, 
assert saying that what that program is expected to do. I just run CPMC for an unwinding of three. Quite often it will find a bug because, because of this small model hypothesis. If there is a bug, there is likely to be a bug in an unwinding of a tree. That's a place where one can start. So students are already encouraged to think of a property and uh, then they are encouraged to actually run a simple tool to uh, prove that property. And CPMC is extremely usable. There's nothing uh, and it's not usable about that. Then they can get it extended to, in case of loops, try to write an invariant and then run CPMC without an unwinding bound. Then uh, see if you're able to uh, prove a property. So it's a, it just inculcates in them a culture, especially if they start seeing that CPMC uh, finds bugs in code, their code, then they get encouraged for them to uh, use. Uh, so here is a common methods community. Let's take a show of hand board. How many of you write programs? Yeah, I'm assuming all of you are proponents of common methods. How many of you have analyzed the programs that you have done for bugs using available common methods? Yeah. So we are selling common methods and are refusing to use it. <laughs>
No, it is a little confusing why um, why we are in this situation where either we have to sell, I mean, you know, made the point that somebody needs to sell, or we have to convince the students, or even the formal methods community, that hey, you should be using formal method proofs. And obviously, I mean, I don't think it's, uh, you know, so why why are we having to push it down the throats of people? Why is it, is there no pull uh, in, in, in kind of, uh, for, for this thing? And actually, uh, you know, if I even think back to like the the grand old folks uh, in computer science and formal methods, Dijkstra has this famous quote which says that uh, testing only tests for presence of bugs, uh, not its absence. And formal methods are supposed to test for absence of bugs. But at the same time, there is this uh, interesting uh, anecdote by Don Muth, where he has written some code and then he has a comment which says, uh, "Don't trust this code. I haven't tested it. I've only proved it correct." Right. So I mean. Clearly, even the, I mean, there is this kind of thing, and people literally say that, okay, you know, formal methods itself is not good enough, you also need testing with formal methods. And probably that, you know, there is some, something there that needs to be, that's where the gap is, and uh, just wondering a lot. In any case, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, I have experienced is that, you know, I'm doing this startup, and we try to, you know, we first joined a startup cohort and we tried to identify the markets for our formal method product. And the first thing, uh, we like we started talking to people and we kind of got very lukewarm responses. And one of the things that I kind of, I later on latched on to was that there are some people who just don't care and there are some people who really care, right? And maybe like the five people, so for example, if I go to a storage company or a, uh, a networking company or something like that, they're using static analysis, all right. So you tell them, hey, I'm going to have this fa very fancy formal method, very great stuff, I'm going to take two hours and I'm going to give you uh, some reasonable answer. They are usually not interested. But if I go to an avionics guy, they already have these certification requirements and they have a like, huge amount of expenditure that they're spending on uh, testing or something like that. So I guess it's also about figuring out who is that person who needs a pull and then focusing on that person. It could be medical devices or it could be uh, whatever it is. And maybe at the student level itself, if people are exposed, maybe that there will be courses on safety critical software and kind of going through the processes of, any thoughts on that? A lot of thoughts may be but uh, So, as to, I have tried studying it a lot. And uh, I'm most of the time. So, why? Thoughts are from the periods on uh, uh, selling. So, who you need to sell it to? You need to sell it to, firstly, you have to demonstrate that it has value. And by value, it means monetary value. So, you just say the cost of releasing this software reduces by so much if you use this tool. That's an absolute one. Without that, people are not going to buy. And surprisingly, in most organizations, there are only people at the top who are affected by this value. The developers are unaffected by this value. Mm -hmm. They really don't get They have a job at hand to write code and get up. So they are not affected by this. So you need to send it to people who are affected. Must be sure, demonstrate value and send it to people who are affected by that. And those people have to be powerful enough to influence the organization. Finding such people is very common. That's the, that's one of the reasons. So I think the, the long term way would be just get a cultural change where people just get used to it. That has to happen. Student level rather than And the sector is really bad because not everyone in the industry is a computer science. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the computer science curriculum that gets impacted because everyone learns programming. Yeah, so I mean, regarding this point about uh, uh, you know getting trained students and hoping that they will go and you know when they uh, get to organization they will remember these techniques and try to use them. Maybe as like he says, anyway, developers don't worry about this issue. But uh, one thing we could do is to train students more and uh, you know just the, the using the tools that are available 
Like we have this course on ISC, on, but that's at a master's level on you know targeting different aspects of the you know like the software development requirements of model checking to core logic and testing and buzzing and some basic you know uh, but more less focus less on theory but on you know just using the So, I hope is that if a student has been through such a course, then at least they would see the value, you know, if the need comes, if the need arises, they could. So, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess most of us are talking about formal methods. I mean, there are two types of formal method tools, as I understand them. One is, one are tools that find bugs, like CBMC, or other tools that we just discussed, puzzles, of course. And then there are bugs that then there are tools that find proofs, the correctness proofs and things like that. So, static analysis is perhaps like finding bugs or um, it's actually both, okay, so, but I guess static analysis is a lot of false positives, that's a big kind of concern. But I mean, which of these do you think is more promising going forward or which do you think is going to win first on which market, in which sector? Or, you know, any thoughts on that? Like, is bug finding maybe you know we are focusing too much on bug finding, and we and we should be looking at a certain kind of sliver of a market which will really worry about proof finding, and not they don't care about bug finding. So, which of these do you think is more important, and which is which has a bigger mark? Which has a I don't care about bigger or smaller, which has an immediate mark. So, uh, I think uh, both of them have a market. Uh, so, I mean, maybe not, so these things give you different levels of assurance. I mean, that's the way I like to look at it. You, you use a bug finding tool. You you get, you know, you find bugs fast and you can fix them and, you know, get going. Uh, so, I think most companies would not, most end users would not really need to use, you know, a more heavyweight tools. But if you have a need like a, you know, safety critical system and you know you want a higher level of assurance, then you go for, uh, you know, proof kind of techniques which, I mean, all said and done, it gives you a higher level of, uh, you know, assurance. Maybe you still need to run, test your program, but at least at a certain level of abstraction, it has, you know, reason about the correctness of your design. Right? Okay. But that set that gives you a higher level of assurance. Um, yeah, so I think both um, have a lot of use. For example, thanks to security vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. proving correctness is a uh, lot of people think it's very important. Mm -hmm. So, if you take ECS as an example, they have to run a static analysis tool, which, and they have to reason about every false positive. Either eliminate it or give an argument why it is a false positive. So, this is for TCS? This is within TCS. Within TCS. The applications that are developed for uh, customers. It has to go through a process where what kind of any, any application. You're going to if you should have done that. And uh, so, so I'm guessing the developers must be really. Oh yeah, yeah it's a, a, it's a pain. Every I time it's it so false positive, right? So, a, so that's a good point. So there are so so many false positives from a developer perspective. If you start highlighting those false positives very early on, and they can modify their code so that that no more shows up as a false mm -hmm. positive, then they start. Then the number of calls was reducing and then they start writing code so that uh, there are no calls positive. So that's, so it, is, it has a big use because of its security vulnerabilities and those kind of things. There will be a lot of use for uh, proving correctness because that's what it is. Bug finding of course has a lot of uses. Uh, windows, there are a lot of papers on the crashing windows. Yeah. So it may not be an easy thing to do but still <laughs> A lot of papers on uh, how just because when you look at Windows as a system, you can't do anything about it. You can only find bugs. <laughs> what are the properties you want to uh, What are the properties of the, uh, several million lines of code? What are the properties you want to express? Uh, Frankly, I find it very interesting that at TCS we have a policy that you know that you just outline. I wonder, are you aware of any other companies that have this policy? I'm sure all of, many of them have. Okay. Uh, many of them must be doing that. So the static analysis is really widely used. Okay. Like he said, Facebook has inferred. Mm -hmm. And they modified things to make, make inferred just because 
and they force their developers to explain each other. Yeah, Google problem. needs to do that. Okay, wonderful. So, I'm sure many uh, companies have this policy because it becomes, especially in light of security vulnerabilities. In Facebook, there are many more reasons why they will want someone because mm -hmm. there are hackers looking to hack Facebook and other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. The only way they can really mm -hmm. is to use it. Okay, just because. Uh, Bob, thank you so
So I don't know whether it's possible to have, you know, a smaller uh, components that are formally verified. You know, I have some modules that are going to be the building blocks of whatever I do. And uh, you know, so let's start with that. Let, let's at least, at least use, you know, components that are uh, formally verified. I think that may be a possible. Uh, and is there any other thing? Already a compiler and operating system exists, right? What would be a no? But then, how do I use that compiler? It's not a, uh, it's not really a, you know, a, a modular component. That, uh, well, you can. I mean, if you are up to it, you can go with GCC and use Comsa. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure very few people in the world anyway. Right. Very few people in the world use it. Uh, but I would still. I, I mean, that's one of the questions. Is it a success? You call it a success. It is commercially viable. People are selling it. Right. So something like maybe a compiler is a good. Uh, Even an operating system. Yeah. yeah. Compiler. So for example, if I I come up with some new optimizations, we can modularize that. Right. I can I can I can separately argue that this you know separately prove that this optimization is correct. Okay. Now I add it back to my thing and I have a kind of up to date system. But uh, I don't know if you can say the same for an operating system where you you, know, you change some. Maybe some scheduling logic for you, you know, allow more things to be uh, uh, imported. So yeah, I mean, I don't know how uh, scalable that is feasible. Yeah, this is the last question. Yeah. 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 So your all of your test upon software basically so, I mean, so do you, don't you see uh, formal verification hardware which is in this case going forward and or what has been happening and going forward? Right. I am not very familiar with the hardware to me, but I believe uh, the hardware is used quite a bit for formal verification, especially the Intel problem. They want to take it more seriously, and things all tools are more scalable than that level. Than, uh, software, level. And software is bulk of it. In terms of size, it is like zero or something. Uh, so that's where the biggest challenge. But I'm not an expert on that. I should say that. Well, but the Nowadays, even a basic starting company, those who have like just a startup, they also do formal education in whichever possible blocks possible. Almost everywhere. Vector and Modi are very recent ones, and they are also like they haven't even launched a single chip, but they are doing formally very fine for last three years. That's all I would expect. Was that Intel disaster? Was really important. Actually, I have an observation. Uh, and uh, the static analysis. Have really taken off it's so hard to find bugs uh, simply for the fact that if you give a developer a report, uh, the developer doesn't really have to worry about the 17 code smells, the code coverage problems, what security issue was there in the code. It just allows them to click on a place and shows them this is the line of code that's giving you a security bug. Uh, so I think because, uh, but a person who's actually set it up, uh, it needs an architect uh, for that task to set up that system. Uh, and the second thing uh, that I think I've observed uh, mostly is that uh, uh, the time to set up the report and how fast it integrates with your existing pipelines. Like if you have a, uh, a continuous integration and a continuous development pipeline in place, and so now you very quickly integrates with that system. So, uh, which is why uh, I think there's a lot of uh, acceptance of Sonar to find that because it integrates with all the other tools in your ecosystem that you do for your SDLC, that software development lesson. So, sorry to take so much time, but that is, uh, that is my answer. Yes. I do agree you should integrate uh, very well, but uh, the question to ask is, do you use market company of the close all the positive that it goes up? And that, that's the real test of the yes. uh, uh, So, an answer to that is, there are false positives. For example, if you have- Of a course there are. Yeah. <laughs> so, there are static analysis to there are Yeah, and the simplest example is if you add a logging line, then it says your code coverage is not complete because it expects you to test even a line that you used to log. Yeah. 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 Yeah
we close it is the question. Alright, I think, uh, you know, our chair is, uh, <laughs> is already standing, so... And you forgot to get your plane. Alright, so I really want to thank the panelists. Thank you. Oh yeah, the